Hey there, this is Johanna speaking. Most scientists now say that early humans were matriarchal. A matriarchy basically means a society ruled by women, which implies that the women control the wealth. And that means in ancient times that the women controlled the food, because food was the earliest form of wealth, I assume. Then how exactly do patriarchies come from matriarchies? If Europe today has a patriarchal system, uh, especially in the Germanic lands and the Celtic lands and so on, and also in Southern Europe and Eastern Europe, where the men seem to be controlling the wealth, that implies for Germany, for example, in rural Germany, the eldest son will inherit the farm from his father. And so the wealth is passed on from father to son rather than from mother to daughter. But how did it came to be so? Well, I found my first clue in this book, The Shadow of the Sun, about uh, Africa, about Idi Amin, for example, by Richard Kapuscinski. Uh, let me read you a passage here. Because, uh, and then I'll give you my reasoning of how patriarchies come from matriarchies. Basically, I believe patriarchies arose together with pastoralism. And the ancestors of the Europeans, the Yamnaya, for example, the ancient Aryans, happened to be pastoralist people. In a pastoralist society, if you have a bunch of discarded men, right, they are no longer dependent on the fields controlled by the women, but they can chase after the horses, for example, in the case of the Yamnaya, learn to milk those horses and live off of the horse milk, which can feed uh, a grown adult and, and your friends, right? And so you have the birth of Menerbünde, bands of men banding together because their society discarded them but rather than submit to that society as the slaves of the women they now become masters of the herds they become herdsmen who control the milk supply basically and and this is very important they are able to leave women's settled agricultural societies behind and roam the plains with their horses so uh here's a little excerpt from the book so this is about the time of idi amin and it describes uh, uh, it describes the situation in Uganda. Uh, the principal characteristic of their status, he's talking about uh, uprooted men who came from the north of Uganda and they moved to the wealthier south. They're called Bayayi or Bayayi people. They will not return to the countryside and there is no place for them in the city. These vagabonds or whatever you call them. They endure. Somehow they exist. Somehow, that is how best to describe their situation. Its fragility, its uncertainty. Somehow one lives. Somehow one sleeps. Somehow, from time to time, one eats. And this is the crucial point that gave me that hint about how patriarchies can come from matriarchies. This unreality and impermanence of existence caused the Baye, those vagabond people, who migrants basically, who came from the north, moved to the south, to feel himself in a continuous danger, and so he is, un unceas he is unceasingly tormented by fear. His fear is amplified by his condition as a stranger, an unwanted immigrant from another culture, religion, language, a foreign extraneous competitor for the contents of the cooking pot. You see, if you have no access to any means of production, and you have no land and no field that you control where you can grow anything and you have no cattle to roam the plains and milk the horses or the, or the cows, then you can't live. You remain a, a captive of the existing matriarchal society where the women control the agricultural systems, right? Uh, which is empty anyway, the cooking pot, and for work for which there isn't any. Basically, in such a matriarchal society, the women are fed first, the children are fed next, and the discarded or useless men, the bottom 80% of men who are considered unattractive, like on Tinder, right? You know, on Tinder, you have this process where the top 20% of men get the top 80% of women and the bottom 80% of men get, get the scraps, right? And so <laughs> this is how it works in the matriarchal system. The bottom 80% of men, you know, they eat last, right? The baye, but... Um, if you, as such a group of men, have no means to escape that matriarchal condition, then you must remain a slave to the rule of the women. Now, let me read to you another uh, excerpt from the same book. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll increase it a little bit. I'll put it in front of the screen. 
So this woman, now he's referring to the mother of Idi Amin, the dictator of Uganda. This woman, Amin's mother, who made her way with her child from a poor village in the north to a town in the wealthier south, became part of the, sorry, part of the population that today constitutes Africa's biggest problem. It is composed of the tens of millions who have abandoned the countryside and migrated to the monstrously swollen cities without securing adequate housing or employment. This is Africa's biggest problem even today, I think. In Uganda, they are called Baye, these vagabonds, the migrants, right? You will notice them at once because it is they who form the street crowds, so different from ones in Europe. In Europe, the man on the street is usually heading toward a definite goal. The crowd has a direction in Europe and a rhythm which is frequently characterized by haste. In an African city, only some of the people behave this way. The others are not going anywhere. They have nowhere to go and no reason to go there. They drift this way and that, sit in the shade, stare, nap. They have nothing to do. No one is expecting them. Most often they are hungry. The slightest street spectacle, a quarrel, a fight, the apprehension of a thief will instantly draw large numbers of them, for they are everywhere around here, idle, awaiting who knows what, living who knows how, the gapers of the world. This is what happens when you are a man in a matriarchal system and there is no room, no, nothing for you to do. You have no job, no purpose there. You're a discarded man, basically. They're, they won't kill you because that might cause anger and rage, but they'll keep you on a subsistence diet. You'll get your little bit of your tiny little share from the cooking pot just to keep you satisfied. And other than that, you're supposed to be a nobody or a nothing. That is the pain of a matriarchal system where uh, the majority of the men will have nothing to do. Unlike the patriarchal systems in Europe where men know that through hard work, they can earn wealth and then own that wealth, control that wealth. They become the controllers and the commanders, the captains of industry, the commanders of banks, the CEOs of big corporations. It is the men in charge. It is the men who control because they, they have something to do. A solution then for Africa would be to somehow escape that matriarchal system and become patriarchal. But why can't they? Why, didn't, why haven't they done so yet? Why haven't, for example, the people in India done this? Or why haven't the people in China done this? Um, and then I had this luminous idea. I pictured myself, the, the people in East Asia, for example, they live mostly of rice fields, but you can't move those rice fields. And you can leave the rice fields if you want to starve. If you don't want to starve, you're going to be stuck having to live close to the rice fields. You will have to submit to the matriarchal systems that control the wealth of those rice fields. Same with grain-based systems. Although in grain-based systems, see, rice is a real community effort. Whereas grain can be done by a single family. So in that family setting, perhaps the man can be a bit more dominant, right? But in these communal settings of the rice fields, there's no escape for a man. A man uh, will have to submit to the, to the rule of women in that situation. But then why are the Europeans so different? Well, the Europeans, they originally are from uh, uh, the southern, uh, southern Russian steppe lands, the Pontic steppe, um, that is north of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, right? Uh, uh, you have these, this massive Eurasian steppe land. It stretches all the way from northern, northwestern Europe, from Ireland, really, all the way to western China, right? You can see this on a map sometimes. It's basically grassland. We call it steppe. In America, they call it tundra or something, or something else. Oh, maybe I don't know the right word. But they call it steppes over here in Eurasia, the Eurasian steppe lands. And these, these territories were vast and could feed large numbers of horses. And the men who learned to follow those horses, not for hunting, but for extracting their milk so they could turn the milk into butter or yogurt. And then, of course, once in a while, you slaughter a calf, right? Or you slaughter an old, an old horse or an old cow or whatever for meat. So once in a while, you would have a meat fest. You wouldn't eat meat every day because you wouldn't want to kill all your animals. You would keep them alive, the ones that you need. Uh, but probably... Uh, at the start of the winter, you would kill the oldest animals that you control, that you manage. By killing them, you can feed yourself a good protein and you can store that in the wintertime. You can store the meat in nature's natural freezer, in the winter snow, in the, in the ice. I've seen Inuit people in the, uh, in the North Pole uh, save their meat in, in basically ponds that freeze over in the, that, that thaw up in the, in the summer, but then freeze over again in the winter and they store their meat literally inside the ice. And then when they need it, they go over there and they, 
they have to hack the meat out of the ice again but that's a great way of storing your meat so you can store the meat in the cold environment during the winter times that's why you slaughter your animals before the start of the winter right so you can preserve the meat or you do it with smoking it smoking the meat but that way by learning to become pastoralists the discarded men of the matriarchal systems of our ancestors were able to survive on their own and importantly without the women they were able to now be mobile leave the women behind because on horseback you can carry some water or you can easily uh, go to find water bodies instead of having to walk over there you just ride your horse over there it's a little bit faster right uh, i don't know exactly how, how much faster horses are when they walk probably four times five times faster than a human being walking so that's a great benefit anyway with horses horses can carry stuff you can carry your materials your tents your uh your water supply your food and so on and so forth your weapons you have everything with you you can leave the women's society and then what happens when multiple men do this what do you get the bands of men the Männerbünde that were so foundationally important for the patriarchies of the european peoples today and i read a lot more about that in this book by chris kershaw the one-eyed god odin and the indo-germanic Männerbünde. Männerbünde, that's the German word for uh, bands of men. This book is incredibly good, uh, but it's intense because it's written in an academic style and you and, and it uses several different languages. It uses old Icelandic and old Norse as examples, for example. And uh, this was a hard read because it's such it's written by such a academic person. They use all sorts of sources and they they show you the sources in the original language and so on. It's a bit hard. It's hard to read this one. But it's um, it also testifies to the fact that it was indeed these discarded men. Let's say 80 percent of a matriarchal society are of the men are, are not necessary, not needed for that society. And these men formed the bands of men riding their horses they became those feared horse riding aryans that we well dream about <laughs> or fear right uh and they then later conquered parts of northwestern india and became their the ruling classes and they also conquered europe and displaced most of the males that were living in europe before that um so that's how i got to this and so I'll, I'll try to summarize this a little bit now then. Uh, so in summary, my question was, how then do patriarchies develop for matriarchies? I imagine that in a matriarchy, the majority of the males, the bottom 80% are considered useless. Uh, they are discarded. They live on the edges of society, outside of town. They are slaves to the agricultural systems controlled by the women, meaning they have to beg for food for their uh, little scraps from the cooking pot. And so they remain in that situation. There's nothing to do for them. Those societies do not develop technologically very well. They are stunted societies. The men have no outlook in life, no future. They're being dominated by the, by the female-dominated society. And of course, the females, they do have their alpha males, right? Um, but in this, in this specific condition where the men are able to leave that kind of... The unwanted men, the discarded men, are able to leave that women's society behind on horseback, for example and they can find plains to roam, right? With massive, massive pastures, as in the Eurasian steppe lands where our, many of our European ancestors are from, the male ancestors at least. Uh, then they are suddenly able to feed themselves with milk and butter and, and occasional meat from a, 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 a slaughtered animal, right? And then the men work together to control their herds, especially brothers and cousins and so on, and twins and so on, especially family, of course, but they start building male, uh, male hierarchies, male-led, male-dominated systems, male-dominated hierarchies. And then all of a sudden, over time, these men who chose the path of freedom become so good at organizing each other with the other men. They become so good at it, right? Basically, what they invent is called equality, believe it or not, because these men amongst each other now create equality or at least enough of equality, even if it's in a hierarchy, enough of human equality, social equality, that they are able to live together and work together without fighting each other constantly. And they become a massive force, a force of conquest, and they conquer northern India and they conquer Europe and they they literally become the ruling classes 
of the territories that they invade. Because they figured out that by working together, men can dominate the matriarchy. And to this we must return. And as my closing remarks, I would like to note that this is the real reason why globalist forces are so attacking the meat supply. You remember, they want everybody to go vegan, right? So they have the fake meat and the beyond meat and stuff, that kind of stuff. But they're attacking the pastoralists of Europe, especially in the Netherlands and other such countries, the main exporters of meat in Europe, by accusing you of doing something wrong with methane or with, what is it, nitrogen or it's carbon or whatever. They'll make something up. Or you're destroying diversity or, uh, or your cows are causing global warming. And, and they'll say, oh, meat is uh, unhealthy all of a sudden. It causes cancer. It doesn't. Processed meats may cause cancer, but meat from the butcher shop does not cause anything because <laughs> you're made of that stuff. You are like that stuff that you eat. All right? All right. So this is why. This is why. Because the globalists at some point have understood, like I just explained to you in this video, that the way patriarchies come from matriarchies is when men have access to cattle and pastures so they can leave the female society and start organizing, build their own male hierarchies, and then return effectively to dominate the, the matriarchies and become the matriarchy's new male leadership, a patriarchy, right? And so I think they've understood that, that that's how it works. And that is why they are so, so in such an evil way, attacking the meat supply, meat production, the meat industry. I don't like to see cows in those massive uh, prison complexes for cattle where cattle are mistreated. I don't want to mistreat cattle, but it makes a big, big difference whether we men have access to our own food supply and pastures or whether that's taken away from us and we must now submit to the digital wallet and the digital idea uh, and the universal basic income, which requires you to be a nice, good person or else you will get uh, negative credits and you won't be able to buy food anymore and you won't have your your carbon points and you can't fly and travel anymore right uh we don't want that situation where men become slaves of a matriarchal of a women dominated system and if you want to prevent that from happening you need to figure out how are we going to maintain access to the pastures and the cattle that we traditionally always needed in order to remain independent from the women's society so that we could be in charge